So this, this is like my cheesy introduction to web components. How many people have actually investigated web components at all? OK. How, how many people would say they're an expert at them? Yes. <laughs> OK. I always get nervous because I always come into things like this, and I'm like, well, I'm not technically an expert, but I've done enough to know be dangerous. So the quick summary, and, and someone who was an expert would probably argue like exhaustively that this is not a good definition of web components. But based on things like uh, HTML5 rocks and, and some of the other stuff that is going around, the, the best summary I can say is you're, you're talking about wrapping custom elements, so custom DOM nodes, uh, to create some type of reusable system uh, that resembles the elements that we get on the web already. So things like drop downs have, have all sorts of code behind them that public can drop down and do all these things. Part of that is the shadow DOM, which is the pieces that you don't see when you do like an inspect uh, on, a, on a typical drop down. When you do an inspect, you get a select tag and maybe the options. You don't get all the scripting things that are causing that to behave the way it does. Um, in addition to that, there are some templating. So HTML templates is one of the things where I kind of argued whether I should put this as a web component. The HTML templates are, it's a tag. And it's not really a web component. It's just piece of, it's a piece of the puzzle that you use to generate custom elements. Um, and then HTML imports is also, it's, it's a, these are all new specs that are coming down the W3C pipeline. Um, they're not necessarily finalized, I don't think. There are some things that are changing. Uh, and browser support, as Kyle and I will both kind of go into, uh, the browser support right now is not native. There's a lot of polyfills that have to happen. And you just, you kind of have to work with what you have, knowing that this is coming to the native platform at some point. And then there's some best practices. I, I'm not going to talk about those tonight because I don't feel, I don't feel like my expertise on this is like I can tell you about them, but I'm not going to be able to say, yeah, this one really hit me hard. Um, but let's, let's dive into this. So I, I created a really sweet new social network called My Magic Book Overflow Plus, which, of course, is like the next best thing. So you guys can, you know, if you want to sign up soon, you can. But the, the HTML for this, that up too. All right. And I apologize, word wrap is on, so there's some weird structure here. This, this is all, should hopefully be all familiar uh, document structure for a typical HTML page. There's nodes and styles and things like that. The, the things that will look different are further down. Where I've <laughs> So, so my ad, my my cool social network, M M M O, uh, M M O B O P, so it's Mba. That's how we not have you the meeting. But you can see I've got some some tags here that are not not native tags. So the default behavior of a browser that looks at these is to say. I don't have any sweet clue what to do with these, but they're formatted properly, so I'll display them. There's two things. Okay, so I'm going to jump around as far as like the, the spec versus like what, what you do. The spec says you have to have a dash. So typically, what what the best practice would be is your namespacing would be the first part, and then that explanatory part of the after the dash. Um, the namespacing, that's not, you can name it whatever you want within a certain small criteria of other things that overlap. But, um, so to create a custom element, it has to have the, the dash. And to demonstrate that, there, there are two, so if I, if I create something called app, there are two states that an HTML element can be in on a page. And Chrome, 
a lot of this stuff is going to be in Chrome because I'm not I'm doing this from what's natively supported, not with polyfills. Chrome has a, a, a pseudo a pseudo element called unresolved, and if we give unresolved uh, like a significant border. red, some padding, and then let's just do this white block. And yeah, that's good. We go back to this. Let's give it a little bit of padding too. Okay. So I hate live coding because I always mess it up, but so what you can see is this unresolved means that um, that the HTML element itself. <laughs> let's see if I trip out can work. It's still hard to see though. The HTML element itself will be what's called unresolved. So if I do, I think it should be in here. Yeah. So if I do something called app. Where is the? <laughs> there it is. Okay. There we go. All right. So the, the prototype of that app element is HTML unknown. The prototype of one of my mbop elements is a HTML element. And so you can see if you if you don't name it correctly, you're not gonna be able to tap into the web component hierarchy and all the stuff that you get in there. If if you get HTML element, means at the very least you can name your, your node the right thing. So you have a dash. That's essential. There's a little more in the spec, but it's essentially put a dash in it and it'll work. So in order to get these to be not just unresolved, we have to instantiate them. And we do that. And I'm going to put all this code up on GitHub so that it's available. We have to register these. And I'm just going to kind of cheat. This is the pi I made beforehand. And we'll talk, we'll kind of talk, go over what this has in it. But. So one of the nice things is that web components, custom components can be resolved before or after. So you don't have to have, you don't have to have the, the declaration of it up front, like in the head, you can still use your script tag at the bottom and it will resolve as it as it gets to the script. But you use a command called register element. And the this is this is not what we'll do, but the register element takes the element name um, oh I know one other thing. Name wise they all have to be lower case. No um, too much I did right here, but really good. Take the node name, and then there's some optional parameters you can send in. But just to get, so you can see that once you register it, that unresolved goes away. Let's just go ahead and add. Hmm, Bob. Title. Okay. You need to comment on your instance. Yeah, so all this stuff's going to get commented right here. Okay. So now, you know, this isn't blatantly obvious because it doesn't really do a whole lot. But now, my match team book overflow plus, the, that title tag, is now no longer unresolved. So you know, essentially, the browser now knows, hey, this is a legitimate element. You can do whatever you want. The 
other ones we can we'll we'll hit as we go. But um, okay. So now that we've registered that, the next thing is you may want to tap into some of the events that are there, and I've listed them here. Uh, so I didn't have that here. We saw for a couple of the, the optional things what were a prototype, and then the extent is just a text name of a node that you want to extend. So you might extend something like a div tab or a button. Let's say you want to make a super super button, uber button. You could say extends, and then you put lowercase button in you know, so we'll, we'll go ahead and look at this. So the prototype is really the one that we'll focus on. The prototype object needs to look like a, a, just a simple JavaScript object creation. The prototype that it inherits from, so it goes in as the first parameter. And so by default, without, without actually putting the prototype in, it will default to HTML element. So the first thing is the prototype, and that will equal some type of object. And then this is where, you know, you can't see that because it's not big, but you have a whole lot of options. We're just going to extend from HTML element just because that's a lot easier. And then that object.create also takes in uh, an optional some settings here. And so real quickly, so creating the callback is when the node is first created, here's some stuff to do. When attached callback is there, that's when it gets inserted into the document that will fire. So these are all events. They're callbacks that happen when the node is placed on the page, when the attributes are removed. So this one, you could, you could actually do listeners for attributes on your node. Lots of things that you could do with that. Um, we're going to look at creative callback. So when the node is placed on the page, we're going to do some type of object here that has, uh, so in this case, when you put this, the, the list of things is a key, ha a key value pair of the properties of that node. So we're just going to, we're just going to set the value. And it doesn't take any parameters or anything. And all we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to adjust the, the inner HTML of our cool title. Once again, this is the pie I cooked before. All right. And so all this is doing is when, when it first instantiates the element, it's going to say, hey, I need to set the value. And, and this function is going to run. It doesn't actually return, so the value doesn't get set. If you were creating like a, a Uber form input field, you could actually set a default value or do some type of scripting to set that value or other properties on that node. So this is real simplistic, but, but the effect is dramatic. <laughs> OK. That was, that was at point where I was going to so, so now we've got our cool logo that combines all the cool social networking stuff. All right. <laughs> How long did you take working out those styles? <laughs> uh, how long is a weekend? <laughs> no. Um, I just worked with them, so. I didn't actually, those probably aren't the right colors either. But yeah, it's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can kind of tell what they are. Right? So so that's, that's like instantiation. So if we look, go back here. Uh, are you? How is Santana asking for streaming this? Oh, I know what I forgot to No, I need to. There it goes again. 
Alright, so. I almost forget where. The URL ends up. Oh, here. Good to you. Carlos. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, I see. Okay. We need one. Ta da! Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, that's the way. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so if we look, there's custom elements. It's really the, the basic thing is to create a tag and instantiate it so that the browser knows to do something with it. I'm, I'm not going to do like deep dive into that, but that, those, those event list callbacks that you have can be used to do all sorts of things. But let's look at, so continuing on with like these four things, the Shadow DOM, does everyone know what the Shadow DOM is? Or is that like, to me that's, hearing it sound just like someone throwing around jargon. So the Shadow DOM, and we can, we can look at it here real quickly. Um, let's go to yeah. So the Shadow DOM can actually be viewed there in Chrome. There's a flag that you can set. To, to see the Shadow DOM, and, okay, that's maybe not the best. But you have a project website, does it? Uh, I bet it does. All right. We'll give, we'll give you a, a preview here. Yeah, that'll definitely have some. So here's a template. Somewhere up the hierarchy will be Shadow Root. So Shadow Root is is what, in, at least in Chrome DevTools, it's what is encapsulating, that's your tag, essentially. So if we scroll up a little, you'll see this is a paper button. So the, the Shadow DOM is, it's the, the thing that kind of sits hidden from the browser that controls templating and behavior and things like that. It's a self-contained self HTML document without all the, the without all the, doc type and all that stuff. It's just straight HTML, including script tags and styles and things like that. Um, it's completely isolated from larger DOM. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and which is, we'll see, is a really good thing. <laughs> so in order to do this programmatically, let's take one of our other elements and let's see here. The only thing you have to add is this create shadow root, and then you're all set. So, and I'll admit to you, this may not be the best um, best JavaScript you've ever seen, but. So up further, we have the welcome, and the welcome has some name that I've dropped in there. Let, you know, you could imagine this is server-side code um, that populates that, and so we want to have a prototype. And we're going to do the same thing that we were doing before. Except in this case, 
we're going to create a shadow root, and then we have to add that to the inner HTML. Or add the root to the element. Really like a little subtree. Yeah. And yet, and yet it's still, you still have the rest of what's the parent above it available theoretically. Like, you have to kind of dig to get it. But, docu if I use, and we'll see this in the next step, but if I use document, document refers to the caller, not the shadow. So, you have, actually have to, there's a little bit of like, Craziness I, to do that. I wouldn't say it's necessarily hidden from inspection because you can still dive down to it using the query selectors. So you can still, you know, you can access that shadow root from anywhere. It's just the like all of the styles and all the, the JavaScript that's running in there is self-contained. But as far as like the CSS styling, I know you can dive down into those shadow roots using the selectors. Like a little, like a little yeah. Okay, so another thing I need to do. So now, now that these are resolved, they're losing the styling that we had. So. Um, So there, there you can see the node that I had just had name inside as the inner HTML. If I inspect, not that. <laughs> Don't print that, please. So if I go look at the inspector, we'll see, OK, here's my welcome tag. And then inside it is the root. And this is the, the programmatically added content which, so what's kind of weird is content in this case will, will render, in the new, right? Yeah. It will render whatever the actual content of the node was. So it, it looks weird up there in the, the tree, but what it's saying is outside of the, the shadow is some text. That, that text is re referred to in the shadow DOM as content. And so it just does a, you know, this is like a simple text replace almost of, I have a node, and I just want to dump a value in, and then whatever else is around that value, I know what it's going to be. It's templated or whatever. Speaking of templates, <laughs> let's look at those. So th any questions on that? I mean, this is, this is, this is like a very simplistic overview. So I, I hope, hope everyone can like leave and go read more of it. But that's what you end up with. Any questions? Why do you have to use So you don't in this in this simplistic case you don't have to. I mean you could I could have easily just said I could have put like a name attribute on the tag. And then said, "Hey, pull, pull from the name attribute on my own tag." In this case, it doesn't really help because it's such a simple. We'll probably see more when Kyle like a fall, where you have more more complex things where you're saying, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some content, and that content is wrapped in a whole bunch of other things, like maybe like navigation." So I give you like list elements, and then those are the content, but I'm gonna style and do all sorts of things. All right, so HTML, tele HTML templates are, as I said before, use the template tag. Okay, I'm 
rid of that. So. Yeah. And we'll give it an ID of, I remember what it was. Drop. Menu. Okay. So in this case, we have a template that says, all right, I have content here. I want to do, and outside that, I'm going to, I'm just, for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say, all right, I want an H1 that says menu. All right, so now, once again, we instantiate our element. This time, let's just copy and paste. In this case, let's look at pulling in two, three. So in this case, we'll say we want to pull in the template. So what, what we would expect here is, right now it's looking, it's going to grab the template, and we should see in here where it says drip and whatever else, the three things are drip profile and settings. Let's see. Oh, um, no. Your template need to be above that script. I don't know. Give that a try. <laughs> so we're still seeing the red red dots because these elements are our custom elements. But you can see now, the whole container of those has been defined. And then we've done some shadow DOM with that using a template. So the, the strength in templates is, is reusability. So if you're, if you're doing a component and you have specific templates that you want to pull in, you may not want to pull those in like you may not want to have those static in the file that you're editing. You may want to have maybe something that you can import. All right, let's talk about that. Okay, so the last bit here. Nice segue. Yeah. <laughs> so this all builds together because you don't really want to have your web page have all your components defined and scripted and your templates and all that stuff on one page. The, the whole point of web components is modularity and reusability. So you want someone to be able to just drop in what you've done, call the element, and then be able to use that, which you're going to see fantastically demoed with Polymer. <laughs> Not this. Um, so it saves you the hassle of, you know, you could say what you said earlier, you could have a regular DOM element, but the problem with that is then you have to tell anybody who wants to use it, by the way, use this JS file, use this CSS. Yeah. Whereas this bundles it all into something you can just plop in. Yeah. So let's let's define 
our our sub menus here, and then I think we'll be set. So instead of going through this whole rigmarole all over again, we know that we're going to do something similar to this. And let's put it into something like this. So this file, not that you can see it, is I, I've called it uh, mbotmenuitem.html. So on, on the page that I want to use that item, right up here in the head, we say link import and mbop what? Oh yeah. <laughs> I used to quote an attribute you don't, this is the new web, you don't know. <laughs> Be in the builds of Opera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone has a copy of it's what is it called? It's called Opera Next. Okay, so in this case, let's go back and look at that file because I'm pretty sure it's not saying the right things. All right, so we want to define an element called Mbop. At the end of this, everyone's going to walk out going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I just, you didn't have that music playing at the beginning. No, the, the copyright issues. <laughs> All right. So an unbought menu item, same prototype, same everything. We're going to look at a template. So if we go back to what we had before in here, all I've done, I've said, all right, I just want to, I just want to have text in there. I don't want to go. I don't. I don't want my designer, let's say, to have to go in and, and put an anchor tag with a hyperlink and all that. I just wanted to put text, and then I'll, I'll deal with it later. So, in this case, it, it makes it so that I can template that out and say, all right, whatever my content is, I want to surround that in an anchor tag and. And I could do an href. Let's say you had a, a you told your, your designer, yeah, include this tag and then put a, an href on the tag. You could pull that pull that value in also. I'm not going to go get that complex at this point. Um, and then let's say I want to do a, and we'll do orange is a really good color, but let's let's make sure it's bold. So I think we've got everything. Let's real quick here. Okay. So this is where if you're in if you're an included file. So this is an HTML include. This is, what, this is what I was talking about, where if I reference a document, this, that's actually the, the including page. In order to get the document that's calling me, I do document.currentscript.owner.com. Document. And so the script says, what's, what's actually, where, where am I actually? And it says, OK, I'm in here. So then, then this is all word, because I'm, I'm referring to the local Imported document. Uh, and I, I didn't really mess around with this much. This you can't do this dynamically in this call. And I, it's it's something with scoping on the import where it's not going to actually refer to the right thing, or the current script doesn't get set until the the import is done. And I'm going to just go out on a limb and say there's probably a better way to do this part. Than what I did, but I didn't know this. So in this case, now it's saying, all right, go in this document, grab this thing, and then we're going to put whatever in there. Um, 
So, what we should see are orange. Now, there, there's two things to notice here. What color are the imported hyperref the anchor tags? Orange. They're orange. What color are the ones at the top? They're, de they're default color, right? Look how I defined it. Just A. So in normal style sheet language, that should have overridden the whole page, right? That's the beauty of the shadow DOM and templating and web components is it's all self-contained. So instead of having to do, yeah, my bot menu item A tag needs to be this and having to do that, no, it's just all in the template. Pretty cool. Yeah, let's let's take a look. If I can find. I think you can get this whole big area. Oh, I've just been pulling the wrong thing this whole time. All right. So let's look. Ah. <laughs> well, you, you're selected the style element right now. Oh, I thought it was on that. Here we go. All right. So utterly bizarre, but it's not really because because it's in the shadow root, it's going to look like it's just defined on on the page. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm assuming maybe you could have a class name find your template, and there would be there could also be a similarly named class name in the regular DOM, and they wouldn't conflict because there's right. I, I think that's true. I think I mean we can try it here too. Well, do you could even do you know same IDs all over the page. Yeah. yeah so that, that's one of the things that's nice is the IDs are unique to the the web component, not like if it's a shadow DOM, IDs can be duplicated across sh multiple shadow DOMs. Oh, wow. Uh, I was, you almost wonder why you want an ID unless, you know, like, you know, IDs with CSS are almost, you don't really need them anything. Yeah. So let's, just for the sake of argument here, let's do. Were they already underlined? Did you underline something? <laughs> let's do. Let's do none. <laughs> okay. It doesn't trickle down. Like there's no cascade from regular DOM to shadow. Now I'm. Mean, I say that blatantly. I there could be cases where that does work, and I think like if you maybe if you called out the specific elements and. Like dug down in the CSS to get to the shadow DOM elements, you could do that. So there's a there's a, a deep selector that you can apply. I know they talk about it in the polymer styling stuff. So as you're if you're trying to theme something and you want everything to you want you actually do want all your links to look the same, you could use this. It's like a slash deep slash, and then whatever you're trying to get to, and it'll it pierces all of the shadow DOM and. Style everything. Where does it way. does it go on the front? It's oh, so from the parent dot. Yeah, so I think if you do slash deep slash like that. Yeah, and then space. Oh. If you're wrong here. Yeah. The selector is probably. I can show you. In the yeah. Package. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's. Does, I'm sorry, does it, but it, I'm assuming it doesn't go the other way. You couldn't deep. You couldn't. I don't know. It's slash. I've, I wouldn't you think so. It seems like it'd be kind of dangerous. I don't. Like, I don't know. think you would want to do that based on just even if you could. No, yeah, I don't. Like want to the the idea of what these are should be 
not global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the answer is you can't have a global feeding to apply to all of the We could. So with the deep, the deep, the deep you can. can. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if Deep is, I, there's an overlay. I don't yeah. know if Deep is specific to Polymer, and they do something in their CS or in their JavaScript that then identifies that in CSS and then does something else. I don't know. But there is a way to, to dig through the shadow root to go in. Yeah, because it seems like it would be quite necessary to have that, because there's always all these modular components that have to keep repeating. Well, so the other thing you. The other thing you can do in here too is you absolutely can just do. Uh, okay, so just, so you, yeah, it, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, keep in mind this is since it's still in spec and not there. There's probably performance hits that you could end up causing by doing things a little different, but that's legitimate right there. And it's not it's not gonna it's gonna download it once and then cache it. The same goes for the HTML imports. If you include it multiple times for whatever reason, it, it will cache it once and then reuse it. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Chris. If you were not to sign on anything, would it just acquire all the from Let's find out. I don't think it will. Oh my goodness, nice. me. I'm stuck with that. I don't even know. <laughs> I just, yeah, we're going to talk. This is the Prince Web. I mean, the artist formerly known as Prince. <laughs> So let's do. I don't think I think you end up with whatever the default styling for a bare HTML page would be. So you'd get like it. Well, let's do this. Let's. Let's just get go to your main document style. All. Yeah. I think you have if you want to style your. Web component, you have to do it somehow. Dump it into the template or into the the style for the the shadow. Now, if if you weren't doing shadow DOM, then it, it is it'll trickle through. So it carries the browser defaults. Right. Which I, you know, the concept of what you're doing, you're building something custom. You want to style. Essentially, it's taking the attitude. You want to style this, go ahead. 